Okay, in this second video, we're going to be taking a look at Aaron's character. So we set the stage here of the circumstance that we're going to be talking about, the golden calf. We did this with Moses. There's a previous video of part one to this. Uh, this is part two. Uh, so we've got the golden calf. That's the circumstance here. If you, if you don't know about the golden calf, you can find it in uh, Exodus 33, 32. Exodus 32 is the golden calf circumstance. Uh, and Aharon said to them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. What do you think Aaron's intentions were here? Do you think he thought that he was going to make a molded image that was going to be something that made Yah angry? I don't think that was where his mind was. I think Aaron was just working with what he knew and what he knew he uh, probably wasn't capable of, but doing his very best. So let's look at the theme of ornaments and what they really are all about. Here in today's society, we've got really fast cars, really nice cars, really big houses, uh, um, Banana Republic and Gucci, right? Those are all ornaments. They're all things that say to somebody else, I am successful in what I do, based on the way that you dress, the ornaments that you wear, the things that you surround yourself by, the things that you have earned, right? So uh, the, the Egyptians had been completely plundered. All of Egypt's wealth came with, came with the Israelites. And earrings specifically, back then and today, are a signal of allegiance. Allegiance to what kind of way of life you are subject to. Torah is the groundworks for this idea. Then you shall take an awl and thrust it through his ear to the door, and he shall be your servant forever. Again, the idea of the earring representing servitude or allegiance. They're very intimately connected. So I believe that Aaron saw that the people were bad-mouthing Moses because they were still enslaved to Egypt. That's the very first verse in 32. Now when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, the people gathered together to Aharon and said to him, Come, make us gods that shall go before us. For as for this Moses... The man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So Aaron sees this, he looks at their earrings, and he says, You know what? Break off all those earrings, okay? All the golden earrings that are in your wives' ears, your sons' and daughters' ears, and your ears, take them off and bring them to me. So that's how Aaron is dealing with this very strong desire of wickedness that's within the people. That's his first step. So then what happens next is not good. The breaking off of the earrings is good. What happens next is not good. The golden calf is Egypt, threatening to rebuild itself in the wilderness. Aaron could have done nothing and could have just told them, be patient, wait for Moses to return. Instead, he took action. He did his best and took action based on his interpretation of the situation. So how did it turn into the golden calf incident? I threw the, these into the fire and this calf popped out. Right. Again, I don't believe this was Aaron's plan, but the strength of wickedness in the few bad apples overtook Aaron's intentions. So from this standpoint, let's view Aharon as weak. Yet, not without proper direction and every good intention in his heart. So coming from that standpoint, let's explore this. When Aharon saw Egypt threatening to rebuild itself, he told the people to break their Egyptian earrings out of their ears. Later, we see Yah doing the exact same thing. For Yah had said to Moses, Say to the children of Israel, You are a stiff-necked people. This is way after 
the golden calf incident, like 24, 48, maybe 36 hours later. Say to the children of Israel, you are a stiff-necked people. He's not saying this to the people who were the bad apples. Okay, the bad apples have already been slain. They're dead. He's saying this to who's left. You are a stiff-necked people. I could come up into your midst in one moment and consume you. Now, therefore, take off your ornaments that I may know what to do with you. So you see, Aharon was on the right track. He just wasn't strong enough to overcome those who had been so weak that they took up the strength of Satan. That would not last long, though. What I'm saying is Aaron's weakness would not last long, though, because Yah chastens those that he loves. Moses took his tent and pitched it outside the camp. So this is after the golden calf has happened. This is after the people have been slain. This is kind of like the result later after the smoke is cleared of the days that followed. Moses took his tent and pitched it outside the camp far from the camp, and called it the tabernacle of meeting. And it came to pass that everyone who sought Yah went out to the tabernacle of meeting, which was outside the camp. So it was, whenever Moses went out to the tabernacle, that all the people rose, and each man stood at his tent door, and watched Moses until he had gone into the tabernacle. And it came to pass, when Moses entered the tabernacle, that the pillar of cloud descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle, and Yah talked with Moses. All the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the tabernacle door, and all the people rose and worshipped, each man in his tent door. That rose part is important. That means that they were not, they were like laying down. And whenever they saw Yah, they rose and worshipped, each man in his tent door. So Yah spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. Why would he do this? Why would he just, just pick Moses out of the blue? No. Moses had shown that he could be a friend to God. Moses showed that he was responsible in, de in handling his relationship with God and his relationship with man. Moses put his desires aside and served Yah's desires. And the result is that Yah spoke with Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. And he would return to the camp, but his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, did not depart from the tabernacle. Kind of a sign here on the side of the path, that there's a rabbi trail. This is the very first time that Joshua the son of Nun, of Nun, Joshua the son of, uh, the letter Nun means life, Joshua the son of Nun, did not depart from the tabernacle. This is the very first time that we hear of Joshua. This is like his introduction. So there we have all that circumstance, the setting up of the tent, Yah coming down, the people rising to worship, no chastening there, right? Well, let's look at it a little bit more closely. Let's set the stage for the mood of this time, this, this time where there was the tabernacle, the people who seek Yah being around that tabernacle, then laying down and only rising when he was around to talk with Moses so they could just, just watch this cloud and just, you know, knowing that Yah was there talking with their leader. They would rise and they would worship. He would be surrounding Moses and, and the Almighty Elohim, worshiping the Almighty Elohim surrounding him. Um, so we've got that. That's what's happening in this time. But what's the mood of this time when we see Moses returned to ask God to forgive the people. That's pretty key. Moses returned and asked God to forgive the people and to put their sin on his own shoulders. We see also that Moses was instructed to go back to the people and be guided by his angel while Yah plagued them for what they did. That's important. It's just one, it's just a couple words it's not really focused on, but it's very important. Yah plagued them for what they did eventually telling them he would not even go with them to the promised land. This sets the stage for the plague of mourning, when the people laid in their tents in mourning, only getting up, to, uh, only getting up in anticipation 
of Yah's presence at the tent that Moses set up. And it came to pass on the next day. So the golden calf has happened. Uh, we've done killed all the really, really bad apples. We've done made the people drink the grinded up calf. And it came to pass on the next day that Moses said to the people, You have sinned a great sin. So now I will go up to Yah. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. Then Moses returned to Yah and said, Oh, these people have sinned a great sin and have made for themselves a god of gold. Yet, now, if you will forgive their sin, but if not, I pray blot me out of your book, which you have written. And Yah said to Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot him out of my book. That's important. Yah says to Moses, Whoever, is, whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out him out of my book. That means that Yah is going to make the people take responsibility for their own actions. That's another very important theme here in um, this Old Testament recounting. Now therefore go, lead the people to the place of which I have spoken to you. Behold, my angel shall go before you. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit for punishment, I will visit punishment upon them for their sin. Again, he is going to punish them for what they did. Each man is responsible for his own sins. Uh, so here we have the whole golden calf happening. Moses going up and saying, put them, put their sin on me. Please forgive me. Please forgive them. Put their sin on me. And then Yah says, look, whoever sins, they, were, they will be the ones who are blotted out of the book now. And then he gives them instructions on what to do now. Moses was ready to just end his life right then and there. That was like basically his instruction for himself. Yah says, that's not how this is going to go down. Now this is what I want you to do. He wants him to go lead the people to the place of which he has spoken. He wants him to be mindful that his angel will go before him. And that, again, um, punishment will be visited upon them for their sin. So Yah plagued the people because of what they did with the calf which Aharon had made. So then Yah said to Moses, Depart and go up from here, you and the people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt, to the land of which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Yaakov, saying to your descendants, I will give it. And I will send my angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanite, the Amorite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey. When Yah tells him that he's going to drive out all those ites, that's Yah's saying a lot there. He's speaking to them in terms of uh, how he's going to handle them and the nations around them. He's going to drive out all those darn ites. And they are going to go up to a land flowing with milk and honey. For I will not go up in your midst, lest I consume you in the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. Boom. So all of the, all this stuff has happened. The golden calf. This conversation where Moses says, I want to uh, take the responsibility for all this. And Yah says, that's not how this is going to go down. Instead, be mindful that my angel is going to be with you. Go lead the people. And then this. So at this point, Yah says, look, you guys are stiff-necked. I can't go up with you. This isn't going to work. What's the reaction here? What happens? The people heard these grave tidings and they mourned. That's the beginning of this plague. Yah plagued the people because of what they did. What was the plague? The plague was separation from him. Look, you, you have done this thing with this God of gold. You haven't put, you haven't put enough umph into coming back to me. This isn't going to work. The mourning plague begins. No one put on his ornaments. For Yah had said to Moses, Say to the children of Israel, You are a stiff-necked people. I could come up into your midst in one moment and consume you. Now, therefore, take off your ornaments that I may know what to do with you. So the children of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments by Mount Horeb. Here we have the Alpha and the Omega, these two extremes, the mourning and great victory. What do I mean by great victory? Well, look at this. 
that last verse is key. The theme of the ornaments' significance and the continued result of the people's misguided desires, coupled with all the work of Moses and Aharon to fight the darkness, threatening to screw everything up, followed by Yah chastening his people. This all results in victory, a small win in getting the Egypt out of the people. The children of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments by Mount Horeb. You see how that verse has a monumental air to it? It was a big deal, a win for the good guys. And Aharon was strengthened in the process. So you see this whole circumstance put into the proper light is definitely an eye-opener for the character of Yah and what is expected of us. We see that Aharon, he didn't have evil intentions to begin with. Aaron was trying to do the right thing. The people who were not strong enough to overcome the darkness, they were overcome by their brothers, uh, by their brothers and uh, they weren't strong enough to fight against that darkness. But through constant striving, Egypt's goal here is to rebuild itself through the people. That's Satan's desire, and Satan's desire was thwarted here in this circumstance. The children of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments by Mount Horeb. And we see that Aharon and the people were chastened and strengthened. All right, so that's the end of our second uh, part, focusing on um, uh, writing Aharon's character and the... Uh, and batting down the, the gossip and the slander of, of Aharon's character that is so prevalent in today's uh, churches, assemblies, and just in our very mindsets. You see that, uh, that lies are just are built into uh, the very church that uh, we all worship within. It's not like this is something that you came up with on your own. This is something that was fed to you from, from birth, and that has been righted now. And praise God uh, for that. Now that you see this from a, a positive perspective, all these ideas here are just kind of scratching the surface of very, very deep lessons uh, for each of us to learn and for all of us to become more and more pleasing in God's sight, in our Father's sight, in Elohim Almighty's sight. So the next video in this Tisa uh, series, you should find it in the description and a card should be popping up now with that there. I hope that I will see you there. Enjoy.